Okay. Good evening, Saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church midweek service. If you have your Bibles, turn to the third chapter of Romans. Thank you for letting us take last week off. It was sort of worked out that way. I started to do, do have a meeting on Thursday and being the holiday weekend, we did, but we had a number of things that came up during the week that um, all worked to give us the night off. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 3, beginning with verse 1. So, what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? considerable in every way. First, they were entrusted with the very words of God. That's the Old Testament. What then, if some were unfaithful? Will their faithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. Let God be true, even though everyone is a liar. As it is written, that you may be declared righteous in your words and triumph when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I am using a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if by my life God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I also being judged as a sinner? And why not say, just as some people slanderously claim we say, let us do what is evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. Our Abba Father, we thank you for your word. Enlighten and open our hearts to your truth. Open our ears to hear our hearts to believe and our minds to understand as we look into your word tonight. May we be fed by this word. May we hear the soft sound of sandal feet. May we see Jesus in him only. And we pray these things in his name through the power of the Spirit. Amen. This um, third chapter is going to take at least three times, maybe more. We'll see as we get there. But as we were looking, we saw last time we met that circumcision benefits you if you keep the law. And we saw that no one keeps the law. So circumcision is of no benefit because you don't keep the law. And that the true circumcision is the one that's been born again. A Jew is one inwardly. We know that Paul writes in later in Romans and also in Ephesians, the second and third chapter, that Gentiles are brought in with believing Jews and unbelieving Jews are expelled from the kingdom or from the covenant because we're under a new covenant. We uh, sometimes think if the, if the word is Israel, it's talking about a different bunch of people. But Paul tells us the ones that are believers are in the same group as believing Jews. So there's one tree. And he also says in 2nd and 3rd Ephesians that he has made one new man out of both Jew and Gentile that believe. So there's no male or female, no Jew or Gentile, no bond or free. We're all one in Christ. But what he's talking about here are that all the ones that are in Adam, that's the unbelievers, all have the same destination, whether they're Jew or Gentile. He is telling 
these Jews that don't believe that you're no better than a Gentile. The people of God believe in Jesus. When God sent His Son, He loved the world in this way. He sent His Son, who is Himself God, taking on flesh to take on the sins of His people. And we see in John, the third chapter, oh, we love this third chapter, don't we? Where it says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever... And we stop there. A more correct rendering of this is this. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His unique Son so that all the ones believing in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then He says, God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned. Anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the unique Son of God. And go to verse 36. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, not the one that does not believe. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God remains on people that don't believe. So how can we say that an unbelieving Jew is God's people? They're not. Only believing Jews are God's people. Only believing Gentiles are God's people. As we understand people, it's harder to forgive, is it not? We think that the people in the Old Covenant seeing all these things in the time of Moses, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, the parting of the Red Sea, the drowning of the Egyptians, manna every day, quail quite often, rocks producing water, and we say, how could they not believe? We have the scriptures that recorded all this. How could we not believe? Because we are blinded by the deceitfulness of sin and our personal sins. You know, when you become to the point where you see yourself in the light of God's Word that He reveals to you who you truly are, the hardest thing to do is to accept forgiveness. You say, what do you mean I get a free, a free trip? Not when you truly understand who you are. Only the person that's not saved sees that. He says, I can do whatever I want to do. But when we see who Christ is and who we are, we know that it's very difficult to forgive ourselves for what we have done to the unique Son and to the Holy Father. And that's why so many of us avoid looking at ourselves. Now, I'm not saying we're supposed to spend our life navel-watching. In the Middle Ages, there was these people called spiritual navel-watchers because they thought it did something to them to bring them closer to God. But it didn't. Now, we're born again because of Christ. And when we behold Him, we're saved. Not by beholding our navels. Not by looking at us. As I made a comment a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday service Martin Luther made. 
when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. And he said, but when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. Because Christ took upon Himself all the sins of His people. All kinds of sins. The worst sin you can think of, Christ paid for. I don't know who you are, what you've done, where you've been, but if you will come to Christ, He will save you. If He will save me, if He will save the Apostle Paul, if He will save Peter, He will save you. He, will, he said, anyone that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And our problem is, we're not willing to come. Jesus said, you will not come to me that you may have life. And that's why they cannot come, because they would not come. We try to blame our failures on theology, maybe. Some people say, well, you're just limiting who can come. No, Christ said, anyone can come. The problem is they won't come. And we can't blame God for that. But when we avoid facing our own sins, this is what we miss. The amazing grace of God. Because He says, if you will come to Me, I won't just wipe the slate clean. I will throw the slate away. He throws it away. In Psalm 130, it says, God, if you kept a record or you marked iniquities, who could stand? And then we see in 1 Corinthians 13, love, God is love with His people. He keeps no record of wrongs. How amazing is that? Do you bring your children into the room and tell them that if they do this and this and this, they will continue to be your child? No! They're your child. God paid the ultimate price for His people, His Son. And that cost too much to let one of His children go. But, it's only when we see the depths of our sin that we can see the depth of God's forgiveness. And we are really forgiven. We see His unconditional love for His children. And it causes us, believe it or not, to love others. You know, we've been richly blessed in this country. It's not because of privilege. It's because of blessing. And sometimes that blessing causes us to hold on to what we have rather than doing what God has told us to do. As we read this, and we'll, especially when we get into the next part next week, this is one thing. I wrote it down here. I'm trying to look. <laughs> Maybe I can't, maybe I won't find it. I can't find it. Anyway, what I was going to say is um, when we look at what God has done for us, and He tells us that we are to forgive others, I want to tell you this. You're forgiving other people has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. Some I've seen people put on Facebook and places, well, if you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. Well, God doesn't work that way. God does not mark our iniquities. But what He is saying is this, if I have forgiven you, and you understand what it is to be forgiven of everything, then you will be likely to forgive somebody else. Because what when I, when I look at 
what I know sin is to be. First of all, it says all have sinned, Romans 3.23. But it says we continually fall short of God's glory every day. In the fourth chapter of Romans, we see that those who work fall further and further behind. But those who rest in Christ are fully forgiven. You cannot forgive somebody expecting that it will cause your salvation to be assured. No, you can only look to Christ to have your salvation assured. It is impossible that we would think that if we could live perfectly, it would assure us of God's salvation. Because the Bible says we continually fall short every day. In these times, though, when we look and we see how far short we are, it says we're all Jew and Gentile under condemnation if we're under the law. It is assuring to know we can look to Christ who fulfilled everything for us. Did you know that you cannot find assurance in your perfected tryings no matter how hard you try? If you were to live today from now on perfectly, you would have no assurance there. Only in Christ do we find perfect assurance. I posted a video on uh, our page, Good, Good News Not Good Advice by Alistair Begg. It's a little four minute video. I highly recommend you go and look at it. But it's the man in the middle on the cross. The man on the the man on the middle cross. But he's talking about the two thieves, and they were both uh, arguing with Jesus, and they were um, being very nasty to him and claiming that he was not who he was until God enlightened one of them. And he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And Beg says, he goes, gets up there to the gates and they said, Why should we let you in here? He says, I don't know. I didn't do anything. And he said, The only thing that mattered was this, that the man on the middle cross said I could come. If you're listening to me tonight and you are not in Christ, the man on the middle cross says, Come to me and I will give you eternal life. Come to Christ today and He will give you eternal life. We see in Romans 3.23 that in Saint, in your lowest point, God did not turn His face from you. If you're not a saint, and I don't mean somebody lives a perfect life. A saint is a person that's in Christ, that has surrendered his life to Christ. If you're not a saint, you can come to Christ because your lowest moment will not keep you from receiving eternal life. You think this is just preacher talk? Tell you what, Philip, told Nathaniel, come and see. Come and see. This is what I know. The longer I live every day, this is what I know. That the more I need the Savior that saves to the uttermost. Because on my best day, I need Jesus. And on my worst day, He's not far from me. And I know this because I've fellowshiped with Jesus. And I see who He is and who I am. And I see the unconditional love that He has for me. 
I'm not a good person and sometimes I've been a very bad person. All you see is some outward stuff. The worst sins we have are between our ears and in our heart. But God says, come to me and be saved from that. I will give you a new heart. Are you the person that thinks he's a failure? I fail so many times. Have you lied to yourself? Nobody's ever lied to me more than I have. And I tell you, if you will come to Christ, He will not have a scowl on your face, on His face when you come. His, eye, his arms will be open. He loves people to come to Him. He says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Come to Christ. Join the fellowship of saints. And in this day and time, there's never a time when we didn't need Christ more. To be honest with you, we need Christ more every day. Your first day of life, you needed Christ. The last day of your life, you will need Christ. Going into eternity, you will need Christ. He doesn't just come and say, I'll put you on probation. No. <laughs> when you come to Him, He adopts you into the family. And we say, Welcome to the family. And as Paul was closing this letter, this is what he said. Now to Him, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, and the proclamation about Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures according to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles to the only wise God through Jesus Christ to Him be glory forever. Amen. Good night and may grace go with you.